we heard this from the likes of Mary Black. My name is Mary Black. Um, I'm 20 and I'm in my last year at Glasgow University doing politics. How Westminster is no longer for the people and she strongly hated Margaret Thatcher and there were many people out there like her. Um, if we were independent for the first time we would have a government that reflected those values. They've now dragged Labour kicking and screaming into their territory as well. So we've got some of the most right wing policies that Britain's seen in a mm. long, long time. I mean, this is worse than Thatcher. In fact, it was a very strongly socialist minded movement of what I was seeing. The old Labour Party was all in favour of the heavy nationalisation. The new Labour Party uh, somewhat favoured the private sector in many regards and therefore this was one of their main reasons for why they wanted Scotland to separate from the United Kingdom was in favour of uh, more nationalisation. A lot of them don't seem to understand the differences between promises and that of economic reality and therefore before the whole independence referendum I knew and I even told people in my old videos etc I said just watch uh, once their honeymoon period is over with the Scottish National Party, people will start to fall away from it because they feel uh, disillusioned, they feel, um, well, they couldn't live up to their promises and this is more or less what you're seeing. No. The, the self-serving government argument where they say, well, waste monster, as they called Westminster, um, self-serving. But for me, the thing that makes it most interesting is that we are in the opportunity to really shake things up because this is a tired system and people are fed up of politics and I understand it. You know, I, I've been growing up and it seems that in Westminster, regardless of whether it's Labour or Tory, nothing seems to change. You know, there's very little difference between those two parties anymore. I don't feel represented by it, and I think the vast majority of people don't feel represented by it. At the end of the day, it was re really never going to be any different from that of the Scottish Government. We've also got something which, personally, in an independent Scotland, I'll be fighting hard for. I can never understand why it is that we've got a publicly owned health service and a privately owned pharmaceutical industry. Why the hell should we allow them to rip us off? Let's have a publicly owned pharmaceutical industry to feed a publicly owned health service. Everything's all black and white and one of the problems that we're faced with is people's black and white view of privatisation. When it came down to their issue on the private sector, they really did not like Margaret Thatcher for that. They hated her for the privatisation. Her supporters admired her steely resolve. Her enemies feared it. Mrs Thatcher was determined to dismantle state control. Many in the loss-making nationalised industries would lose their jobs. Some industries, like shipbuilding, would shrink to a fraction of their former size. They don't understand why she privatised. They don't understand why the private sector is favourable. And so, to protect nationalisation, to have more nationalisation, they thought the, the answer would be Scottish independence. Now that's not to say that every Scottish nationalist that voted the SNP was all in favour of that, or that's not to say that the SNP as a party itself was really in favour of that, but you had a lot of people who, like Mary Black, initially that was what they were aiming for. That was their main argument for Scotland separating from the United Kingdom. My support of the no vote was not because of a self-serving government. It was not because of the current economic system today. It's not like I'm protecting that. And it wasn't because of anything at all to do with anything of, of Westminster government. Because you wouldn't really be changing much at all in that regard uh, on this argument because you would just end up with more of the same. And this is because people's expectations exceeds economic reality. And therefore, all the promises of pie in the sky from the likes of the SNP to uh, the people of society, they buy into it. And it, because economic reality does not permit it, the politicians can never provide for them. And let's just be accurate in this debate. The banks themselves 
today are saying that the contingency plans that they've drawn up, and that's what they are, contingency plans, don't involve moving their headquarters. They involve moving their brass plates, their registered offices, oh, and the yeah, banks yeah, say yeah. they don't involve moving any jobs. So if the banks say that, let's not have that's scaremongering not well, well, from the no parties. Not and these politicians will never tell them that. They will never tell them that because at the end of the day, if you want to win people's vote, well, unfortunate as it is to say, you're going to have to lie to them. Let's face it, most people in society don't really understand. It's not an insult to them, they just don't study economics, they don't, you know, study economic history, they, you know, the government knows that. Their argument was that they wanted Scotland to be very much like those economies. But at the, at the same time, a lot of them despised Margaret Thatcher. The message may not have reached the Labour Party, but it certainly reached our friends and competitors abroad. Despite the world recession, despite those long years under Labour, Britain is back in business. They hated her for deregulation and privatisation. And that's not to say that all of the Scottish nationalists who supported the likes of the SNP were in opposition to the private sector, but a, a, a good and a large contingent of them certainly were. Oh, well, your country is going to have a publicly owned health service and a mail service which has been privatised in England that won't be privatised in Scotland. Whilst a number of them despised Margaret Thatcher for deregulation and privatisation, those Scandinavian economies, by far and large, all have strong private sectors and they have low levels of government regulation. Now, a country like Norway is something of an exception, but these countries are not sustainable in the long term, and that's what a lot of these people don't understand. You would hear the arguments persistently over North Sea oil. Now, that is something I can touch upon later, but the point being is that you would hear the, the heavy dependency upon all these natural resources, and that's not the way an economy is supposed to be run. Norway is an economy that was too heavily dependent upon North Sea oil, and therefore it got its high GDP off the back of the North Sea oil, being the fifth largest oil exporter in Western Europe. However, when you look at their domestic economy, their domestic economy is in serious trouble. Not only do they have a debt level that is skyrocketing, they, ha they are faced with extremely high cost of living. Now, it's not just a case of just throwing up the tax rates, etc., and raising the minimum wage and pretending that everything's all hunky-dory and there's no problems. It's far from the truth because what high prices in the market signify is scarcity and that's what an economy like Norway is faced with. Their domestic economy is faced with a severe lack of productivity in their domestic economy because of the high prices basically that signifies that and that happened because of the extremely high tax rates. Their economy cannot sustain itself in the long term because as I say North Sea oil is not going to last forever, and natural resources simply don't. The whole point of a, an economy is not to be too heavily dependent upon natural resources. In fact, it's to limit your use of natural resources. It's a question of how you allocate scarce natural resources into commodities to provide for the market without causing waste. And this is certainly um, far off from what Norway has um, achieved, in fact. Um, Norway has abused the North Sea oil, uh, so to speak, and that's why it had the extremely high GDP. Uh, I think it's there's a, an automotive company, Kongsberg Automotive, who only has about 5% of their workforce left in Norway, and it's because they cannot afford to produce in their own home country. So therefore they get, you know, countries such as Mexico and of course China, where most of their workforce work away in those countries to produce for them, because it's cheaper to do so. Again, even when you look at the Scandinavian economies, their unemployment rates are far higher uh, than what 
the official figure state. Uh, for example, Denmark has an unemployment uh, rate that's three times higher than the official figures. And, and even when you talk about those who strongly hated Margaret Thatcher, and this was, you know, something they made very clear, even Mary Black didn't hide this in many of her speeches. She hated Margaret Thatcher over things like privatisation and deregulation. I can re even read to you a quote. The 1980s was not a period of financial deregulation. Insider trading was made illegal in 1980. The life insurance industry, which had been almost free of regulation for over a hundred years from 1870, was re-regulated from 1980 to 1982. The bank deposit insurance was introduced in 1979. The sale of investment and insurance products came under statutory regulation from 1986. Further, the first ever regulation of UK bank capital took place under Basel I, agreed while Thatcher was Prime Minister. When it comes to the benefits cap, when it comes to attacking those in receipt of benefit because they're too crippled to work or because they can't find a job. When it comes to attacking those who have sought asylum in this country, those who are the easy pickings for the bullies that want to make scapegoats out of immigrants. When it comes to ordinary low paid workers on zero hour contracts who are getting attacked, I ask you this. What pensioner, what immigrant, what low-paid worker was responsible for economic collapse in 2008? And the answer is none of them. None of them were responsible for economic collapse. We know who was responsible. The responsible ones were the rich and the bankers and the politicians that allowed those unregulated markets to do what they wanted, when they wanted, to make as much money as they wanted. Now there lies the problem folks, because as Tommy Sheridan was saying, the unregulated markets. There's no such thing as unregulated markets. First and foremost, you have government regulations, which is socialism, and you have the market that regulates itself. In other words, capitalism. Uh, that's the difference between the two of them. It's whether you, you have the market that will regulate itself, which he's trying to say is what caused the banking crisis, which is so far off the truth it's unreal. And the reason being is because the Financial Services Authority controlled the UK banking regulations between 2001 and 2012, and the FSA handbook was more than 10,500 pages long in regulations. So. There was no unregulated markets that caused the banking crisis, rather what led to the banking crisis was simply because of the very issue that they kept protecting bad banks from failing. The bad banks became too big to fail as a result of the government protectionism taking their risk away that led to incompetence as well of course poor economic practice. Uh, they were getting uh, away with what we call legally protected fraud. And that legally protected fraud meant that instead of the banks paying for their own losses due to government protectionism, it was actually the taxpayer who was paying for their losses. So that's why it led on the path to the banking crisis. So their argument on Scottish independence, on the whole issue of being that the banking crisis was caused by deregulation is false. The fact that they opposed a lot of the privatisation worried me because how can you have an economy like the Scandinavian countries when they all have really strong private sectors? In other words, they are social market economies. They have strong free market principles. Therefore, they have strong private sectors. Then you are faced with the issue that if you do have that problem where uh, they favour the higher tax rates, you are connected to the United Kingdom. So if you had an independent Scotland, you had higher tax rates, who's to say that businesses will stick around to 
uh, keep their businesses in Scotland when they could move south of the border and pay out lower tax rates. Uh, so therefore you'd probably be faced with a large capital flight. And again, this was one of the reasons why on the run-up to the independence referendum, you began seeing uh, creditors pulling out of Scotland and in fear of Scotland separating from the United Kingdom, but that also was in relation to do with a currency issue. 